I was reading something. Okay, let me click go live. And we should be live right now. Yep, I see it on my screen. Okay, uh, we are live. Hello, ocean friends. Um, it's what it says on the label. We are hanging out with two scientists who were on board our research vessel, Ocean Explorer, on its maiden mission to the Red Sea pretty recently. And while the Ocean Explorer was there, we discovered a brine pool in a place that we didn't expect to discover this brine pool. Um, brine pools are exciting in and of themselves for a whole bunch of reasons that I will let our ocean scientists explain. And then this one was doubly exciting because it's in a place we never thought to have found one. So um, with us, we have Dr. Sam Perkis, who Sam is a, geo, a marine geoscientist at the University of Miami. And Maddie, would you say Rodrigue? A? Rodrigue. Rodrigue. Maddie Rodrigue is the science lead with us at Ocean X. Um, we have a cool short film that explains this whole discovery. Should we just launch into the short film and then come back and, and discuss amongst ourselves and <laughs> with all of our ocean friends? Let's do it. Okay. Good plan. Jessica, roll the beautiful brine footage. Uh, A brine pool is an accumulation of very salty water at the bottom of the ocean. And the water is so salty, or we'd call it saline, that it sits as a pool beneath the seawater. It gives us a window into how oceans are born. And indeed, we know this from 100 million years ago when the Atlantic formed, when it was a baby sea, just starting to open up like the Red Sea is today. But the processes that were going on in the early Atlantic 100 million years ago are very poorly understood. But with the Red Sea, we can watch it in process today. So it's an incredibly powerful analog to the formation of all of the oceans on Earth. Quite recently, a brine pool was found not at the spreading axis of the Red Sea, where there's a lot of volcanic activity, but slightly off it in shallower water. And that gave an indication that maybe they exist in other environments. They'd certainly never been found outside the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aqaba, and they've certainly never been found on the coast, which is where we found it. Yes, it might be long along the wall. Uh, it kind of seems surprising that we just, unless it's ginormous, that we just pop across it, right? That's a bit Unless it ran the whole length of the bottom of the floor. Yeah. First one in the Northern Red Sea in the Akamai. Wow. We'd been driving for eight and a half hours across this barren, abyssal plain. And I felt incredibly guilty because all of the effort had gone into finding nothing. And something changed in the far distance. It looked a little bit murky. And I remember the seafloor was getting darker. And we were starting to approach the wall from the coastline at that point. And I thought, oh, we must now be at the end of the dive and we've failed but the image got slightly darker. And then as we got closer, there was little bits of seaweed which have washed down from the shallows, but they were floating just above the seafloor in a really weird way. And then the lights from the ROV cast down and you could see the bow wave from the ROV propagating out across the brine pool. And it was the most beautiful thing. And I remember the first thing I felt was relief. <laughs> Look at the waves, look at the waves. Oh, 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 oh. 
Oh my goodness. That's huge. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Anything that goes in there doesn't move. Yeah, yeah. Are you sure that our ass is in the water? <laughs> The CTD was the only way that we could get samples of the water back to the surface and also measure the chemical properties of the brine. And we had to have the CTD and the ROV down at the same time because we were using the ROV to see what was going on. And there was a lot of trepidation because they're both tethered to the ship by cables nearly a mile and a half beneath the ship and there's an incredibly high chance that they're going to get tangled and cause the loss of the ROV, the loss of the CTD, or both. So what we did is we lowered the ROV down and rested it on the brine because the brine is so dense. And once we'd got that positioned, we could give the signal visually of when to trigger the water sample. So the first sigh of relief was when the CTD appeared in the video coming from the ROV, because we knew that it made it down that far without getting tangled. But then to guide it down literally centimetre by centimetre, very slowly to make this very precise point, and then actually seeing the bottle snap close with the water inside it, it was a huge relief. It was very exciting because I don't think this has ever been done before in such a precise way. There's a lot of life around the brine pool and even within it, and it doesn't seem to be coincidence. It seems that organisms have learnt about the brine and are using it to their advantage. So there were these huge armies of shrimp which live on the rocks looking down into the brine, and it seems that when anything goes into the brine by accident, before the organism dies and sinks to the bottom of the brine pool where it's inaccessible, the shrimp rush in and snatch it from the brine surface and they're using the brine as a trap. The reason why this is so special is that to get this sort of environment you need hydrothermal activity. And if you're going to get hydrothermal activity you need plate tectonics. And if Earth is one of the rare planets which has plate tectonics and that can produce such environments, it's conceivable that life in the universe is very rare indeed. Perhaps we're the only ones. And if we're going to go out into the universe and look for life elsewhere, we're going to be targeting uh, planets or moons like Europa around Jupiter, where we understand there's a hydrothermal circulation, and you might have brine pools very similar to what we're seeing right now. We nearly missed it. I mean, we were close to giving up. And it just goes to show that if you're at the bottom of the sea and you've got 15 minutes left, push on. It's a privilege. Take every single minute and every single second you've got because you never know what's around the corner. We can unmute ourselves. I might have muted you in the process. <laughs> there you go. So is it kind of weird, Maddie and Sam, seeing yourselves in this film? <laughs>
Well, let's be clear. Sam is the real star of the show here. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, a lot of close-ups. That's, that's the first question I have is um, whose idea was this? And Sam and Maddie, like who whose role was what for this mission? Um, I can start maybe with a mission overview and then Sam, you can talk about your specific focus if that works. Super, yes. Great. Um, so OceanX partnered with NEOM to visit the Northern Red Sea area um, and conduct a multidisciplinary cruise um, where we were basically surveying the entire ecosystem. We were looking at below the seafloor, the seafloor, the water column. Uh, we were looking at species of large animals like whales and whale sharks and large fishes and, and other types of sharks. We were looking at um, coral reefs, both in the deep and the mesophotic um, and also in the shallow uh, shallow water reefs. We were looking at the health of those reef systems. We were looking to see if, if they'd been wiped out with bleaching or extreme heat events, or if they were resilient to those events. Um, and we were also doing um, aerial surveys and, and sort of island hopping surveys, terrestrial ecology, where we had a team um, on a shadow boat that was looking at um, birds and other different species that inhabited these small islands in and around the area we were working. So for this particular cruise, we had about 22 scientists on board and Sam was leading all of our marine geology um, and uh, sort of deep sea ecology portion of the cruise. Okay, and then Sam, this was your idea, this dive. Did you know you were gonna find a brine pool? Like, did you say, guys, let's launch the ROV, let's find a brine pool? Well, I did say that. I, we, I had a <laughs> hunch, I, 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 had a, I had a hunch um, that we would find a brine pool. But it was the most terrifying day because, because we didn't find it for the majority of the day. I, I had a, a feeling the brine pool would be much further out to sea. Uh, away from the coastline, which is where we, we launched the ROV. And then we started to drive it very slowly and steadily towards the coast. And, and as I said in the video, it was an all day affair. Uh, and there were, I'll be honest, there was not a lot to see. It was just this boring, <laughs> you know, abyssal seafloor for hour after hour after hour. And you feel guilty. You feel really guilty <laughs> because you can hear... The ship humming away. You can hear the engineers, you know, walking the corridors. The laundry room is whirring. There's pots and pans clanking in the galley. And at that moment, everyone on that ship is working for that one opportunity to have the ROV on the seafloor. And when you're not finding anything, you, know, you feel very, very guilty. But we stuck with it. And it was right, right, right at the end of the dive that we found when... um, the brine pool. So literally I, minutes I, I couldn't believe it honestly i think um i think too what people don't um understand about this particular mission is and and for anybody that thinks how could like launching a deep sea robot and surveying the deep ever be boring but let me just tell you <laughs> we had done i think we we're on like day 35 of a 42 day expedition and we were running these transects almost every day and and sam had a nickname um, on board uh, because he would always take want to take two scoops of sediment along whatever transect we were doing so he could look at the different properties of that se sediment so he started calling him two scoops sam perkis and so for this particular <laughs> dive um, everybody on the crew, we all actually had um, bets going on whether we would find the brine pool or not. We had it on the whiteboard in mission control. And, and um, I think that there was still quite a bit of faith in you, Sam. I know I personally was in the, we're going to find a brine <laughs> column, but I think also I was really hopeful for it because on our media side, they um, had been asking about brine pools in the Red Sea since the mission ideation sort of began. So we were really excited about it. And we had a whole plan for what we were going to do if we got there. And then of course we all got so excited. We we're like, what's the plan? <laughs> um, but I think, I think overall, you know, it was, it was so um, it was looking at mud and there are screens all over the, the ship and everybody was just glued yes. to the screens. And so for eight hours, people were just like, did we get it? Do we get it? And then as Sam said, you know, we were about to give up. Um, the guilt was about to overcome it, but, um, but yeah, we, we stumbled across something amazing. I should say, yeah, the, the footage that we're looking at now is when we have arrived at the brine pool. This is not the mud. We also, <laughs> um, for anybody watching, Zoom doesn't want to render this in as 
crisp and clear resolution as what I'm seeing on my computer. So we in the chat have put a link to the same footage that I'm sharing, just so if anybody wants to see the visuals nice and crispy 1080p HD in one window and listen to us in another tab, highly recommend. Because um, <laughs> it is really beautiful. And I can only imagine, I, I mean, Sam addressed this in the video, yeah, but the feeling of like, wow, how many people are on the crew? How many people are on the ship? And if you hadn't found it and you've made them look at mud all day for nothing? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so I mean, what we're seeing now, this is, this is just the shoreline of the brine pool. And you see all of these beautiful colors in the video. It's slightly orange there. And there, there's the pool just coming in on the right-hand side. These are these incredible microbial communities which are making a home um, beneath the pool, and that's the gray color beneath the brine itself, and then on the beach of the brine here. And we're really excited by these microbes. We're just doing the DNA analysis at the moment because the brine is just this incredibly inhospitable uh, environment. It's completely anoxic. There's no oxygen, incredibly high salinity, and you would think it would be the worst place on earth to make a living, but there's these rich, rich microbial communities and they're different. You see, you have the community which is orange there, so we, which prefers to be a little bit closer to the brine. And then as you go to the back of the picture, as we've seen um, it now, you get this sort of graphite to dark colored community of microbes. So there's a zonation in the microbes which are eking out a living in this incredibly hostile environment. And we, we call them extremophiles because of this extremely you know, unpleasant, difficult environment that they are, they're, they're managing to eke out their living. So they're uh, um, incredibly exciting organisms, even though they're single-celled and you know, microbes, um, we can learn a lot from them and that's the analysis. In fact, we've just been working on that in the last days, getting the DNA ready that we can start to sequence it and see, you know, see who we're dealing with here. <laughs> Yeah, is there anything, neighborhood? <laughs> yeah, is there anything interesting that's yes. come back so far about that? I mean, I guess you're just now getting it back, so it's too soon to say exactly who we're dealing with. We don't know who we're dealing with in terms of the microbes, but we will do soon. We've we've conducted, I'd say, preliminary analysis on the brine that we managed to collect by lowering that instrument, the CTD, down into the brine and then triggering it to to capture the water at the precise intervals as we went down through the brine. And we're starting to understand where all of this saltiness is coming from. Of course, you know, what makes a brine a brine is an incredibly high salt content. It's very, very saline. And now we're examining uh, where that saltiness is coming from. And it's probably geological formations which are buried uh, deep beneath the sea floor. And then we have circulation cells probably driven by hydrothermal um, processes which are circulating water beneath the seabed and bring it back up and then that's carrying that highly saline water uh, which is weeping out um, onto the seabed to form the pool the brine pool itself so that's what we're working on at the moment trying to understand this entire system how does this oh maddie go ahead you well, i was just gonna say it. um talking about like highly saline incredibly dense anoxic like completely oxygenless environments too. I mean, when we, what you aren't seeing from the video is um, as soon as we got down to the sort of brine interface, which is that like ripply layer across the top, um, we have a, oh, there's the Pepsi can. Oh man, you know, that's still on the ship. It's so pristine. Oh, did you guys pick that <laughs> you up? Picked it up? Yeah, oh we did. yes, we yeah. picked it up. We yes, were, it's, that's for you. Yes. Yeah, it's <laughs> from like the eighties, I think, right, Sam? Yeah, it's it's certainly it's certainly an old um, it's an old can indeed. But the, the the pool is acting like a trap. I'll talk about that in a moment. So we we for um, trash, but also for good things. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Matty. Go ahead. Oh no, that's okay. So what what we noticed at first too was um, and Sam, I I think you probably remember this. We all were just puzzled by the forward facing sonar and the ROV because it was like this. It was picking up these little boulders and things here, and then it was like you know 
black empty nothingness. So we would get little blips for these little boulders on the screen. And then as the ROV, the sonar is pinging sound to try to see what's in front of it a certain distance, it was like we were getting the shoreline, but we weren't getting anything in the brine. And that's because the brine is so dense that the sound didn't actually penetrate and refract, reflect back to the ROV. So it was incredibly interesting. And that's really the way that we were traveling along the edge and marking waypoints as we went to try to get a sense of the size of it was using that forward facing sonar and using our, our cameras can only see so far in low light. So we would have the sonar out, you know, 50 to 100 meters and we'd say, okay, now it's starting to curve a little bit. Now we can see sort of as we go across, when, when do we pick up the wall on the other side? Because the, the other side was, you know, um, you know, the toe of a mountain that extended what 1800 meters up to the, to the sky. Yes. Yeah. We were deeper, I think, than that that mountain was tall at this time. And um, and then at the yeah. same time, we had uh, the CTD on the ROV, too. So conductivity, temperature, depth device that also it takes, um, you know, salinity measurements. And it also it takes temperature and it takes um, dissolved oxygen. And so the first thing we noticed, too, was salinity shot up to be four times higher than the surrounding water. Um, in the Red Sea, which is already incredibly salty. Then the, the oxygen completely bottomed out to nothing. And then um, the temperature, I was actually really surprised by this. And I don't know about you, but I was really surprised that it was only a degree warmer than the rest of the ambient yes. temperature. I, I always assumed that it would be a yeah. hot brine, but it's a cold brine. Yes. I, and with that, we had to be very careful and tentative because oh, brine pools in the Red Sea, which have been discovered before, the brine can up to be up to 200 degrees Celsius. So absolutely, you know, way too hot for the, for the ROV. It would destroy the ROV. It would cook it alive like a lobster. <laughs> so, you know, I, we, we were treating the brine surface with a lot of trepidation, you know, trying to get a feel with it and then building our confidence so we could start to measure it to make sure that we weren't going to damage or, you know, worst case, lose this incredible, you know, piece of equipment, which was now dangling nearly two kilometers below the ship. And so, you know, it took time to build our confidence. And actually, that's a beautiful view of these microbial uh, communities, isn't it? This is just on the beach of the brine. The brine would be on the right-hand side. And the little dark dots there are mussels, little bivalve mollusks. And you can see these army of shrimp that I mentioned in the video. There's a couple of them there, which hang out just on the seawater brine interface and it seems that they look down into the brine and any unfortunate creature which by accident swims into the brine is immediately stunned because there's no oxygen i mean it just uh, instantly suffocates and then dies but once that poor beast sinks to the bottom of the brine pool the shrimp they can't reach it because they can't go in the anoxic water either so they're just hanging around opportunistically and they'll dart out into the brine and grab any little organism which has stunned itself um uh before it sinks and so that you know you see these little you see these shrimp and they're they're really i think they've learned to use the brine like a trap they're trapping uh, unfortunate beasties which uh, fall into it there he is there they look very small in the camera don't they but actually they're they're quite big yeah they when were we, um, we had the lasers the scale. Yeah, we had the la the scaling lasers are 10 centimeters apart and they were almost that that length. Yeah. Yeah. How uh yes. Maddie or Sam, so we've got mollusks, we've got shrimp. Could we do they do they not boil? Would they taste good? We probably wouldn't want to <laughs> eat them because of where they live. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I what think kind the, of shrimp, shrimp the shrimp the <laughs> shrimp I mean, at least the shrimp are living in the seawater. The, the mollusks are living just on the interface of the brine and the seawater. And I'm in that sort of microbial ooze. And you, you can see the, the dark spots there are the, um, are the mussels and the, the staining on the seafloor of the microbes. And what we think is that there's some sort of... Um, the, 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 the mussels are probably ingesting the microbes and have the, micro, the microbial organism within the tissue of the mollusk itself. And there's some sort of symbiosis going on there, which allows the mollusk to um, sort of feed on the byproducts of the metabolism 
of the of the microbes. So, so basically, the, even the little muscles there. So basically, Sam, yeah, what you're ahead. saying is that if we eat those muscles that have ingested the extreme bacteria, then we become some kind of Avenger superhero, Spider-Man well, type muscle muscle person. <laughs> I think that, that, that's one possible outcome, Matty, but uh, you <laughs> might also, also become gravely ill. <laughs> I have a biodiversity question about the shrimp. Are these, do we know what species of shrimp they are? And each brine pool around the global ocean system probably has slightly different like chemical makeup. So does that mean that each brine pool has like a slightly different subspecies of little brine shrimp? Well, we don't know the answer to that question yet. We did sample some of the organisms, like the mussels and the shrimp and some, and some very peculiar fish, which also seem to be hunting <laughs> on top of the brine. Um, but uh, I'm sure that's the case. I mean, this is a very um, unusual environment in the deep sea. I mean, uh, the, the brine pools are very rare, and that's why we were so excited to find one. Uh, we don't know how long lived the brine pools are. Maybe they're ephemeral that they come and go, or maybe they persist for a very long time. And that's something that we're trying to find out by taking cores, extracting the sediment uh, beneath the pool, which is something that we did on the second dive after, after we discovered it. But I think it's a very good point, Micah, that, that you do get um, sort of bespoke ecosystems which develop around the brine, especially the organisms which are using the brine as part of their life cycle, because they may not have anywhere to go. I mean, this is their universe. Um, it's very difficult to disperse to other brine pools in the Red Sea because they're hundreds of miles away, quite possibly. Certainly, we didn't, uh, once we found this one, we thought we had the brine pool finding skills, you know, that we'd be finding brine pools on a daily basis, but we didn't. And so, it seems that we were very lucky, and this really is very rare in this particular part of the Red Sea. How common are brine pools generally? Like, how many known brine pools have we discovered? Like, I don't know the exact number, well, but there, there's a handful in the, the Red Sea a bit farther south. This is certainly the first one that's been discovered in the Gulf of Aqaba. And then there's a handful in the Gulf of Mexico. And as far as we know, those are the only two locations that they exist. And to add on to what Sam was saying, I think that we did have a little bit of good luck on the second day that we went back to visit because we were trying to go um, 500 meters or so south um, to see if we can find the southernmost edge of this particular pool. And we dropped in pretty much directly on top of a much smaller, but very spooky looking, completely different pool. So <laughs> we, yeah. we, were, we were pretty, we got, we got okay. We were pretty good at it. <laughs> I'd say so. Well, I now yeah. I have a question. Uh, people want to know, like, like how deep is the? Is it just a thin layer of brine that's sitting, or is it? Is there some depth to this layer of of brine? So it it at the maximum depth that we found, it was about six meters deep, which is quite which is quite deep in the grand scheme of things. I mean, if you were standing on the bottom of it, you'd be far. Um, the surface would be far above you. The thing um, that was tricky is that the echo sounder, the sonar sounder on the bottom of the ROV is designed to measure water depth in normal salinity seawater. So it doesn't work in the brine. Even if you dip the instrument in the top of the brine and you're taking depth measurements with sonar, they don't make any sense at all because the sonar is not calibrated to work in brine. So we had to measure the depth by pushing probes down <laughs> into the brine at different places. It sounds very old school, but it worked. And then we could sort of probe out the seafloor contour of the brine pool. So it's quite shallow in many places. Like here, we're looking down through the brine and you see that lovely wave as the brine swashes backwards and forwards. But it does get a little bit deeper as you work your way out away from the beach there. And that's what we're seeing there. Those are, they look like little eels, don't they? But those are seagrass leaves. Uh, of course, seagrass doesn't live in two kilometers of water. It's coming from way up in the shallows, uh, probably being ripped out by storms and waves and so on and so forth, and then sinking and then getting captured in the brine, just like that Pepsi can from the 80s that we saw. <laughs> but the seagrass would normally, if it landed on the seafloor, it would just be 
um, eaten up by, you know, just all the usual bacteria and fungi which live on the seafloor and it would rot away. But because the brine is anoxic, it acts like a trap and preserves uh, all of this stuff. So just like that Pepsi can was from the 80s, you know, some of these seagrass leaves could also be decades or perhaps even hundreds of years old. And one thing we did is, as I said, we took a core and we pushed it down through the seafloor beneath the brine and then pulled it out again. And we're working on that now. We're just working on the dating to try to understand, you know, how much time is captured in that column of sediment that we recorded. But what we're starting to realize is that the brine is this, as I say, is this highly effective trap. Anything that falls into it because it's anoxic is preserved. And we think we have this, this exquisite climate record recorded in the sediments of the brine pool, which may go back, um, well, certainly many centuries, probably thousands of years and possibly tens of thousands of years. And so that's something that we're starting to dig into now to reconstruct the paleoclimate of the Red Sea in the geologic past. That segues really beautifully into the question that I had, maybe starting with Maddie, but Sam, I know that you've also spoken really passionately and inspiringly about why the Red Sea is so cool. But I wanted to put into context, like Maddie, why was Ocean X in the Red Sea? It's, it's pretty special it, for a lot of reasons. So like if you had to name like a few reasons why the Red Sea is such a cool place and why we wanted to explore it, what you got? Well, I think that the reason why Ocean X was so interested in going to the Red Sea is because so little is known about it. There's been so much work done in shallow water systems, and Sam himself has actually done quite a bit of work <laughs> for quite a bit of years um, in the Red Sea. But but we knew when we went, um, and, and we sort of hedged all of our bets on this, that anything that we discovered would be new to the, the region, which has been really um, underexplored and underdocumented, um, and every discovery that we would make would be new to science, um, and and that's really held true. I mean, this this was one incredibly exciting discovery that we were able to make and then measure um, and quantify, and then be able to also document and bring back to you all. But at the same time, there are so many more that I can't wait to share with the world because that trip, I think for our program especially, it really changed how we looked at the vessel itself, how multidisciplinary cruises could work on Ocean Explorer and, and how much we could accomplish in an expedition time period with great people on board. Um, so I think for us, um, it was a really special trip. And I think that we were all a little bit nervous about going because we didn't really know what we were gonna see, right? There's so little evidence. We kind of knew generally, but we're in the Northern Red Sea, so little documentation about what to even expect there, the animal life, the, the reefs, the geology, everything. So just even going was a big risk, especially for um, our media team because they need to know what they're going to be able to see so that they can produce videos. Um, there's a bit of, what is that ancient, Ancient uh, plastic, I, maybe. It looked like It'll a pair a... of pants on the approach that somebody had just <laughs> taken off and left there, but that's clearly not what that was. Those are not um, SpongeBob Square Pants' as pants, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so so speaking of like things are new to science. One thing that um, Sam mentions in the video, you expect to find. Okay, so a brine pool forms. Tell me if I'm getting this right. It's my pop quiz hour, the brine pool forms uh, kind of at a crack in the crust, right? Where all this hot stuff is getting seeped, seeping out. And so you would expect to find it where the, the crust is spreading apart at what we call, you call the spreading axis. But you said this one was not right along that crack, that spreading axis. So how did that happen? Does this, does this location of this brine pool kind of upend what we know about the geology of the deep sea in, in an interesting way? Yes, I, I, you're quite right. You, to, to drive that hydrothermal system, uh, you need sort of volcanic activity. And that's typically happening where you're pulling the, uh, the crust apart and you have volcanism. So volcanoes um, at the bottom of the sea, to put it simply, and you don't have that where we were working up here in the Gulf of Aqaba. So uh, 
it was certainly a surprise um, to find it in this location. But we still had a hunch. I mean, this wasn't a complete fluke. We, we had a hunch that there would be brine pools here because we were in a particularly deep part of the Gulf of Aqaba. And what we had understood is that beneath the seafloor of the Red Sea, you have these very thick deposits of salt. Uh, and when I say thick, they can be up to three kilometers, so more than a mile thick uh, often. And they were deposited about uh, seven million years ago when the Red Sea completely dried up. So it had become a sort of a, a baby sea for the first time and the seawater had flown into the Red Sea. And then global sea level dropped as we went into a glacial period and the Red Sea became separated from what was the uh, Mediterranean at that time. So it was no longer connected to the global ocean basins and being in the desert as the Red Sea is, all the seawater evaporated and left the salt behind. And that gave these huge salt deposits which now are buried beneath the seafloor of the Red Sea. And to make a brine pool, our understanding was you needed hydrothermal activity to move the hot water uh, beneath the seabed and you needed that those salt deposit to, to be dissolved and then you carry that saline water up to the seabed to make the pool. So we had an idea of the ingredients for a brine pool, but in this particular case, we thought that, that, that this area of the Gulf of Aqaba had got so deep because the underlying salt deposits had been dissolved and the seafloor had dropped down by more than 500 meters or so. So the question is, if you're dissolving all of that salt in the subsurface, you know, where does it go? And that's what gave us the hunch that we'd find a brine pool. But it's certainly a very different flavor of brine pool than's, than's been discovered in the Red Sea before. And so, yes, it certainly does expand our horizon to where you might find these incredible environments. There's I'm, a shrimp. There he is. Look, he's, the, so he's, the shrimp should theoretically be in danger. He seems pretty bold. Like he seems pretty in the brine. Are I, we not concerned for him? Well, the, he's, he's he, right at that interface layer. Well, uh, yeah, it, he knows what he's doing. He really looks like <laughs> That's the in I think he, That is a he, confident shrimp. He does shrimp. it all day, every day. <laughs> yes. I suppose natural selection will quickly weed out the shrimps, you know, which, which don't quite have the skills <laughs> to, to hunt on the brine surface. But he, yeah, you see, he's hovering just above it. And what we think he's doing is he's looking down onto the brine surface and then looking for flailing organisms, which are, you know, probably little fish or other shrimp or, or so, which have fallen into the brine. And then it's almost like he, he swoops down like he was just doing there and grabs them. And we actually, Matt, if you remember, we saw the shrimp doing that. Yeah, um, I do remember you know, it was we, we, spectacular. <laughs> we, we settled the ROV down and just sat and waited for about 45 minutes and just watched the, um, the story playing out and the shrimp, they quickly go back to their behavior and they start hunting on the brine. Um, there, there's the surface there. It's very otherworldly, isn't it? So this is when the ROV was um, sitting in the brine. And so once we started, yeah. once we took all of this sort of baseline data that we needed to collect to know that it wasn't going to, you know, melt the ROV <laughs> if it landed um, in the brine, we were actually um, thinking, okay, well, maybe we'll try to use the ROV as a metric of measurement to understand like how deep it is. The same with the CTD and the, the push course that Sam was referencing. And um, the really crazy thing is that's a six ton ROV, something crazy like that. And um, it was, they had to put all of the thrusters on full force to get it to even slightly penetrate the density of that layer because wow. the ROV, when it goes out, is designed to be neutrally buoyant and everything. So, so then in water, it's neutrally buoyant and the thrusters move it wherever it needs to go. It's quite a bit of power. There's 12 thrusters on it, but all of them we're thrusting to try to get it to sink into the brine. And that's the, as far as it would go in, what you're seeing right there. So when you say it was resting on the brine, it really was just literally. Yeah. Wow. Wait, I, this might yes. be a fun question, but just so I can visualize it, if a person could somehow survive down there, would they be able, like without being crushed or anything, could they stand on the brine? Is it that dense? Like people could yes. just walk on it? 
Wow. It, it's okay. that dense. You, you would, um, it would be sort of, well, sort of cross between a, a trampoline and a waterbed. You would just <laughs> bounce on the surface of the brine. Just And you can see the, just now in the video, these are the waves which are coming out from the front of the ROV. And they they go almost in slow motion across the brine surface. So you would ju- it would be very much like a waterbed. You could stand or lay on top of the brine. And if you try to swim down into it, you would quickly just bounce back up to the top again. And there, there, there's the you see that's there's the little there's the little shrimp there. You just see him in the distance. He's still doing his hunting. Dangerous. <laughs> and you, you've got to remember that usually this environment is complete blackness. I mean, we're in two thousand meters of water, so it's normally no light at all down here. So the shrimp is not. He's 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 probably sensing the vibrations of the brine surface and animals which have got caught in it. He, I'm, it's too dark to see anything by a long, long way. Somebody did have questions. Actually, the, that's a good, the, the, the comment about the thrusters and the light um, that, we, that we were bringing down here via the ROV, does that change the behavior or disturb the ecosystem um, when we're down there with lights and thrusters or what kind of effect, somebody was asking what kind of effect that has yeah, I mean, I don't know that we really noticed any significant changes while we were down there. The shrimp behavior really didn't change. Like they, they sort of were still hanging out around the edge and then still going in to, to try to, to pick off. And, you know, we had shrimp come right up and basically completely disregard us. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, we were able to film this amazing footage because they, they would come right up to the camera lenses and just hang out and do their sort of um, pattern, their, their swooping pattern, looking for their prey. Um, in general, we, we do document, um, you know, the ROV's impact on things like the deep scattering layer, the dial vertical migration um, with various acoustics and then also, you know, hydrophones and the like. And, and we've noticed that um, for in certain areas when the ROV is descending, um, the prey layer, so this, this sort of baseline layer in the deep ocean, um, if we have all the lights on when we're going down, we've noticed, we've tracked acoustically that that layer sort of scatters around the ROV. And then once the ROV is through it, um, 10, 15 minutes later, they sort of come back and we can actually pick up the signal of that line reforming of this migrati- migratory layer that comes up and down um, as the the 24 hour, hour day cycle continues. So we've tracked it before, but I per, I don't think we really noticed any um, changes down in this environment. And and sometimes we use red lights as well, don't we, Matty? Which also yeah. um, the the eyes of the deep sea organisms aren't sensitive to. So we we do everything we can to mitigate you know our presence in their in their world. Um, but in this case, yeah, yeah, exactly as Matty said, I mean, the, beha- the best way to know that you're disturbing something is its behavior changes or it becomes skittish or so. But um, all of the organisms around the bl- brine pool just carried on their usual <laughs> sort of like it, it seems their usual behavior, perhaps intimating that they're blind and that they, um, you know, they're not they're not using their eyes at all in their everyday life. So. I would refer to it um, as what, supreme, or no, maybe extreme nonchalance. <laughs> yes, yes. We, we saw some, it wasn't just the shrimp that were hunting in the brine. We saw a, a flat fish. We think it's a, a member of the flounder family, which we're currently looking at, uh, quite possibly a new species. There were eels, which also are hunting and were actually diving into the brine mm-hmm. um, and then coming out again before you know, that it had its there's lethal effect. Light. So they knew what they, there's the red light there. And we uh, also, did we, Matthew, we saw the little, um, the sh- small sharks as well were also yeah. uh, hunting around the brine. Um, what was it? He was a, what Big was the name of the hound, shark, Matthew? The smooth, smooth hound. hound? Yes. Yeah. So Big they, eyed they, smooth they, hound sharks. Yeah, they, they um, are pretty common actually in the area, but we didn't know that they were found this deep nor did we have any record that they were found around a brine interface and around the, you know, extremophile micro beach of a brine pool. So we we had quite a few instances where they would come right up to the ROV, um, check us out and, and sort of swim off. Um, or they would just stick around and, and um, continue to <laughs> hound us, as it were. <laughs> yes. 
And it seemed that they knew what they were doing with the brine as well. They certainly weren't blundering into it. They, it seemed that they were also um, swimming around the surface and certainly around the edge of the brine pool looking for you know, organisms which have become trapped and then, um, exactly. you know, they would be easy prey. Right. I'm shocked to hear, I will just, everybody knows, but I'm not an ocean scientist. I just get to talk to you all as part of my job. So as a citizen, I find it shocking that you said the eels can go in and out of the brine itself. Um, are they doing like a five second rule kind of thing? Do they have a, some kind of slime yes. thing or yeah, like how that's incredible. Yeah. Yes, and it, 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 one of the videos when we were watching the eel, it seemed that the uh, the individual in question might have slightly exceeded its five second rule, <laughs> and it went limp, and you know it, it looked like it is asphyxiated in the brine, but it, it managed to get out of the surface, and then it sprung back to life and then carried on its daily business. So um, it, it's it, it one thing that was striking is how quickly you know the brine's lethal effect being completely anoxic you know, takes over anything which stumbles into it. So it seemed that the eel was diving in to pluck out prey, but um, exceeded its own five second rule, but it just got away with it that time. So, you know, we hope it's learned its lesson. <laughs> or if it didn't, natural selection at work, um, eels with better time management well, will survive. <laughs> exactly, and there, there, there was a, the, these shrimp, which we're watching now, they are certainly, you know, would not let, uh, um, you know, an unfortunate accident to an eel go to waste. They would pluck it out and, uh, you know, have it in no time. But I could watch these shrimp for hours, honestly, because, I mean, if you look, you see when they swim up, they're using all this energy and then they sort of drift and they stop moving their legs. They stop ex ex like exerting that, that much energy. And then they, when they get to sense the layer, then they go back up, right? So you're seeing them conserve energy reserves on their way floating down. They don't have to keep themselves suspended all the time, just as long as they know exactly when to kick in the, the hyperdrive again. Yeah. So I just think it's so fascinating. Can they, I guess, like I Sam mentioned earlier, they can feel the vibration and that's how they, or the density, they're able to sense that they're touching the brine and they go, whoop, time to go. Yeah. I don't know. I, mean, I was this wondering one about that, Sam. I don't know if you have thought, because they have slight, the, some of their legs and antenna look like they're slightly longer. And I wonder if those almost have more like sensory... Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, th this little fellow, when he's when he's dropping down, he's almost touching or just touching the interface. So maybe he is using his antenna or so, and it's just when he gets that signal that he's approaching that deadly interface, then he just brings himself up again. But you, you can see I the mean, color of the shrimp there. That yeah, I, well, I guess it's good practice. But you look at the color of the micro of the microbial community there. It's like this bright orange. The, uh, and we're just at the beach of the pool there, but you see that bright orange color? That's all from the uh, the microbes, which are living, you know, just on the brine interface. There he is. So he's he's just on the beach now, and now you can see he can safely settle down and have a rest. <laughs> I could watch him all day too. I have a, a question to stir the pot a little bit because it's World Oceans Week. There's so here at Ocean X, we are using this week to remind people that the oceans are cool and we should explore them because there's lots of uh, important things we can find out that could be the key to, you know, the future of humanity on a habitable earth. Um, because it's a big year for space, Jeff Bezos is going, Elon Musk is going, NASA's on Mars right now. So I have to stir the pot a little and get you both to, um, talk about what well, brine pools have a lot to do with outer space um and i wonder if one of you would like to leap into the melee and draw out that connection between the brine pool and the search for life in space well sam i think you said it really well in the video honestly if, if we do find life on other planets, it might look like this. And so the technologies and tools that we design to even get to the point where we can, you know, accidentally discover and then access something like this, our, our technology for ocean exploration was absolutely critical to be able to do any of that. And so I think, you know, if, if the goal is to find life on other planets, and I think that that 
is a lofty goal to be fair, but it's exciting nonetheless, it's exploration. Um, I do think though that we need to turn to the oceans first. We barely understand a majority of our planet as it is, especially knowing that this was just sitting here waiting for us the entire time. And we know still so little about it. And Sam is obviously doing his due diligence to find out as much as he can about the system, but, but still it's one pool in a whole ocean. Right. So think about how much there is left to explore and to discover and, and think about how exciting this is and how much it can unlock climatology, time, geological time frames, new species, extreme species, life in a completely different way that we ever thought life could exist even on this planet. I just think that the scope is incredible for what we can do right here on Earth. And there's a time yes, I element, right? Like we might be running out of time to explore some of this ocean stuff or no, because it, it could be threatened and not exist for ever. Well, I, I mean, if, if I speak to that, um, you think you're down nearly 2000 meters in a very sort of remote part of the Red Sea that you wouldn't see any human influence or you'd hope you don't see any human influence. But one of the things that we did see for the ROV is the amount of detritus, human detritus. There's Pepsi cans and plastic and water bottles. And, and it's certainly not the case that uh, human influence is restri restricted to the shallow water. And that played out really as a theme throughout this expedition mm -hmm. in the Red Sea, where we were working in these extreme depths. You're hardly a few minutes as you transit across the deep sea floor before you see evidence of humanity in some sort of trash or so. So it really, um, it's, it's depressing uh, to be truthful. And yes, we're certainly damaging these ecosystems even before we've discovered them. That much is, that much is clear. Back to your, should I talk a little bit to that point about uh, space there and, um, Life forms on Earth, as we understand it, about 3.8 billion years ago, so a really, really long time ago. And the initial idea that the first life on Earth appears in what we call the primordial soup, it might be some sort of tidal pool next to an ancient ocean, but our understanding has been revised. And what we see that if we look at the most primitive, primitive organisms on Earth, they are extremophiles, like the microbes that we find living in and around the brine pool, that they're living without oxygen and sometimes at very high temperatures. So the prevailing wisdom is that life probably originated on Earth in the deep sea in hydrothermal settings, just like this brine pool, and certainly in the complete absence of oxygen, because the early, early oceans on Earth there was no oxygen at all. So the environment that we're finding here on the brine, at the brine pool is probably a good analog to where first life on Earth appeared. And with that, if you're going to be looking for life in the universe, it's these sort of environments on ocean worlds, as we call them, other planets which have hydrothermal activity um, is probably a good bet to where you might find primitive life. So, th so that's another link, you know, building on what Matty said on why these extreme environments on Earth might instruct on where we should be looking for life in the universe. Sam, you mentioned in the video about discovering the brine pool that, um, you know, plate tectonics are a part of what contributes to hydrothermal activity, which is what gives you the conditions for life, and that plate tectonics could be rare in the universe. Do we? have a sense for how rare we think that is in the universe? Or is that like just too big of a question to even? Well, I, mean, I think, no, I think we do have a good sense. Certainly Earth is the only planet in our solar system which has plate tectonics. So it seems, you know, it's, it's rare when we look in, in our solar system and all of the things which had to conspire to make plate tectonics possible. And in fact, one of those was the formation of the moon. Uh, the moon is just a big chunk of Earth, which got blasted off by an impact with another planet about four billion years ago or thereabouts. Um, if that hadn't have happened and we didn't have this large moon around uh, uh, Earth, we wouldn't have plate tectonics and we probably wouldn't have life. 
So it seems that plate tectonics is one of those rare, rare things which might be one of the reasons why life is present on Earth, perhaps not very common in the universe. Um, no, I'm not saying there isn't life in the universe, and, <laughs> and of course we should seek it out wherever we can, but it could be that plate tectonics and life are intimately connected, and you, you can't have life without plate tectonics. And here we are seeing a manifestation of what the sort of extreme environments that plate tectonics can create and our understanding is that this is a great crucible for perhaps creating life itself so i mean that sounds maybe a little bit like hyperbole but th these sort of discoveries that like we're making at the bottom of the red sea you know have profound implications for our, the understanding of our own planet but might have carry with it profound uh, lessons for you know life beyond our planet and that's why it's just so so fascinating to work on these things and I can't emphasize enough that it's so hard to make these discoveries without an incredible vessel like the Ocean Explorer, which is being controlled by such an amazing crew that Ocean X can bring to the table. I mean, these aren't chance discoveries. It's being in the right place with the right equipment. And, you know, that's why I think I said it in the video. It's such a privilege to be involved and to have these this opportunity and... I, I, it's great to see the results coming in. Well said, sir. Are you both, is there, I guess, conscious of your time because you probably both have cool scientific discoveries <laughs> to be contributing to, writing up this amazing <laughs> data. But is there, you know, when we hop off this call, Sam and or Maddie, which, uh, what questions or answers are you most excited about cracking from this? Uh, what has this got you revved up about figuring out next? I'm, I'm really interested in the results of one, the, the analysis on the core itself, um, seeing the results from that analysis that Sam will be doing. Um, and I'm also really interested in seeing kind of who's in the neighborhood and what their, what their uh, day jobs are. Um, and more importantly, I cannot wait to go back. Um, I, I am so excited. We, we kind of know a little bit more what to expect and what to plan for. And we'll definitely bring more cores, for example. Um, but we, I think planning the next adventure, um, finding more of these pools, um, finding different types of these pools, different compositions of these pools, that, that I think is what I'm truly the most excited for. From, from my side, yeah, I mean, it's very much along the lines of what Matty said is the core that we managed to push through the bottom of the brine pool um, I think it's going to have an incredible climate record uh, to understand how the climate has evolved perhaps over tens of thousands of years in the Red Sea. And that's very difficult to retrieve that sort of information in any other context. And the brine being anoxic with no oxygen, you know, preserves uh, history so effectively. And the DNA analysis we're doing on the microbes to see, you know, who these characters are that are making these beautifully colorful stains on the seafloor that we're seeing in the camera right now. And I have an idea that I'm rolling around to, um, to instrumentalize a brine pool and put a long-term observatory down for a number of years to find out, uh, is this a boring, sort of every day is the same type environment or is it actually quite dynamic? And we think it's the latter. One thing that we have already recognized in the core is that there's avalanches which are coming down from the, from the shallow water and then rushing down and being trapped in the brine pool, uh, probably triggered by earthquakes. So it's this is not a, it seems quiet on the day that we were there, but there's probably actually quite a lot going on down there. And, and to put a, a lander, a brine lander, that uh, we could call it down into the pool and then record over a number of years, I think we'd be surprised about you know, how, how dynamic this environment is in terms of what's coming down from the shallows, but maybe also the brine is getting, the pool is being recharged and filling up and draining away. Maybe the temperature and the chemistry is changing, which adds to, you know, how it, an extreme environment is for any organism which is trying to make a living, you know, not only in this very hostile place, but also this very dynamic place as well. So, you know, I think there's some great science that we could do on the data that we've already collected, but to have the opportunity to go back and revisit this um, 
it would be incredible. I think we can discover a really a great deal. Is that, We're excited. You, you could your, probably detect that. <laughs> Brian Lander be uh, sending you back live updates or not live updates, but maybe periodic updates, or would you have to wait for years to get all the footage back? TBD. Well, it, it we we. <laughs> We're looking um, into different options there, but it would certainly be recording and could be retrieved from time to time and then download the data that it would be recording and then redeploy the lander. Or it might be that it can send it with uh, an acoustic modem. So as long as you have a ship with the right equipment uh, up above, it can transmit its data and then carry on its business of recording uh, afterwards. So there's there's many options there, but to, uh, TBD. Stay okay, tuned. Because I would definitely subscribe to a Brian cam if it were possible. <laughs> um, is there anything that- Well, it would, it, would, it would certainly have a Brian cam. <laughs> is there anything I didn't ask you, either of you, that you're just really excited about and need to get off your chest uh, about this mission before we thank everybody and hop off? Oh, I just, you know, it, it, I, I'll just re repeat what I said at the beginning that to, to be able to, conduct an expedition on Ocean Explorer with such fantastic scientists like Sam and to be able to make these discoveries with people that are truly passionate about their work and about the discoveries to be made, um, passionate about exploration, passionate about trying new things, new tools, new sampling methodologies, and just truly, you know, it was, it was an absolute privilege to be able to, to, um, to go on this expedition. And I think this discovery is an added bonus to that privilege. Yes, I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd echo that. It's one thing, uh, you know, I'm a professor at a university and I can sit in my office all day and have ideas, but you don't make discoveries like that. And to be partnered with Ocean X and have the um, opportunity to work with such a professional crew and, um, and team on Ocean X, as I say, it was pretty stressful this day where we'd done eight hours of recording nothing but barren seafloor, but you would never have detected that amongst the people who are driving the ROV or the people in mission control or up on the bridge who are controlling the ship and watching, you know, this boring footage come in. And, you know, that's how discoveries are made and we made it at the end of the day. And it's just a privilege to be, you know, invited on this incredible vessel to work with such a competent team and, to get the science done. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget the opportunity. There's more that can be done, but if there's never an opportunity to come back to the brine pool again, you know, I think it, it's all worthwhile. It, it is just such a thrill to make these discoveries um, when no one has been there before. Thank you so much. I'm very, much. very grateful. <laughs> Sam and Maddie, we're grateful. It's a privilege for us to get to hear directly from the people who were there since we can't go ourselves. So thanks very much for sharing with us. Thanks Ocean Friends on YouTube and around the internet for watching. We're gonna wrap up the live stream and then Sam and Maddie, you don't have to leave. We can say thank you and goodbye, but we'll um, stop the live.